Hi, welcome to our first installment of What the Bible Says About. I'm Pastor Steve, and it's so nice of you to join us. We're going to talk about what the Bible says about itself, because that is about as fundamental as it gets. Think about it. Why would you care what the Bible says about anything if you don't understand why the Bible is important in the first place? So we're going to take this first message to talk about the Bible itself, and then we will move on to other topics in future messages. But as always, we should start with prayer. So please join me in prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for this time you've given us together to study out this topic. I ask that you would visit everyone who is tuning in from the other side of the internet and touch their hearts and minds. Conform all of our thoughts to you so that we hear what it is you want us to hear, we learn what it is that you want us to learn, and that you and only you are glorified through this. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, friends, so grab your Bible if you have not already, and we will start out with some historical information, some factual information about the Bible itself. So what is the Bible? Well, this is the Protestant Bible, and it has 66 individual books inside of it. So it's kind of wrong to say this is a book. It's not. It's 66 different books. And we don't know entirely how many authors put it together because we don't know who wrote some of the contents inside, but we know there were at least 40 different people who authored these 66 books over a span of 1,500 years. And even more amazing, it was written on three different continents. And so how do you get a collected work like this that tells a singular story like it does when it has so many different authors living in different areas of the world at different times in history, except that there must be something supernatural about this book. Well, it is broken in the kind of macro sense into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament was written in the days before Jesus Christ. And although it does cover a lot of different topics and, and sources of material, it is ultimately always looking for Messiah. Where is the Lamb? Who is the Lamb? Where are we going to find this messianic figure who is coming to save us? And then the New Testament is really all about Jesus Christ, who claimed to be the Messiah and who Christians worldwide believe is the Messiah. And so the overarching theme of the New Testament is to behold the Lamb, right? Whereas the Old Testament is looking, where is this Messiah? New Testament is saying, here is the Messiah. Behold him, listen to him. Now, it's important to know these distinctions, not just because it orients you as to why and by whom it was written, but it was also, they were written in different languages even. So when you are looking at a Bible in the United States of America, you're probably looking at a Bible written in English. All these words in here are in the English language, but none of these books originally were written in English. So that means every word in here is a translation from something. So let's talk about that a little bit. The Old Testament was written primarily in the ancient language of Hebrew. Now that is still a, a language used today. It's been modernized a little bit, but it is more or less the same as it was all those thousands of years ago. Every once in a while in the Old Testament, it departs from Hebrew. There are portions of it that were originally written in the language of Aramaic, which is similar to Hebrew, but, but it's not entirely the same. So those two languages, Hebrew and Aramaic, as time went on, uh, they ceased to be very popular languages in the world. Whereas once upon a time in the deep, deep history, uh, many nations, even outside of Israel, many nations spoke some form of dialect of these languages. But as we were marching toward the New Testament era, that began to change. And while the nation of Greece was the dominant nation 
of the world. So we're looking around 200 years or so before the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. The common language of that part of the world at that time became Greek. And the religious leadership inside of Israel realized that they had a problem. Whereas their religious texts were all in Hebrew and Aramaic, the people themselves no longer really spoke that as their primary language because that had become Greek. So in those couple hundred years before Jesus walked the planet, 70 elders of the nation of Israel were commissioned to sit in a room and translate all of the Old Testament scriptures from their original languages into Greek so that they could be read by the people alive at that time. And I'm stressing the number, it were 70 elders, and that's important because they were, they were essentially assigned this task not to be concluded until all 70 elders agreed on some sort of authoritative translation into the Greek language. So the final product of that undertaking is known as the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. Septa coming from the Greek word for 70. And you'll, you'll see this when it's referenced in written form, you'll see it often abbreviated as LXX, which is the Roman numeral for 70, right? Indicating this is the translation of 70 elders or the Septuagint translation. Now, what this means is that when Jesus was alive in the New Testament days, the Bible in common usage by Jesus, by the religious leadership, would have been the Septuagint. That's interesting, isn't it? The New Testament, as it was written in that same culture, was written in Greek. That should make sense. That was the language most people were speaking at that time. And so, in the days of Jesus, there was ultimately every religious text that we have in this book today was available to those people in the language of Greek. But it didn't stay there, obviously, because the lingua franca, the common language of the world, ceased to be Greek as time went on. So as the Christian church came into power and came, kind of consolidated into the entity that we know as the Catholic Church um, from this point in history, that church adopted Latin as its primary language over time, once it became kind of concentrated in Rome and Italy. And so they eventually commissioned a translation of the entire Bible from Greek and even from its original languages of Hebrew and Aramaic into Latin. And that Latin Vulgate translation became the, the dominant primary translation used by the Christian church for a very, very long time, until around the 1500s or thereabouts when we began to see Protestant reformers, even before that word was used, there were various reformers who tried to bring the scriptures into the language of the people. And so from that point in history onward, we begin to see translations like we know them today. It was the early 1600s when the King James translation was published. And then of course, the new King James was much later than that. The 1970s, I think, was the new King James. And the more modern translations have come since. But I'm going through all of that as more or less a history lesson, not necessarily to point you to one translation over another. You should use the translation that is in the language that you understand best. It mostly doesn't matter which translation you use. If your goal is to find salvation, if your goal is to learn about God, if your goal is to get to know Jesus Christ, then pretty much any Bible you pick up is going to get you there. And I believe there are certainly some versions of the Bible that are better than others in terms of the strength of the translation or um, the ease of the language or even an accuracy issue. But I don't wanna say this Bible's good, this Bible's bad. I want you to be comfortable with whatever Bible you're holding in your hands right now. If it's a language you can understand, that's the Bible you should use. So let's begin to look at what the Bible actually says about itself, okay? 
I want you to open up into your Bibles to the New Testament book of Hebrews, and I will meet you in chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Now, I'm not going to wait for you to find it because this is an internet-based program, so you can always pause this video if you need more time, but I want to be respectful of your time. So Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The Word of God says, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So this is a powerful claim, amen? The Bible is saying that it is alive. Now, how's that? How can that be? This here is just a book. It's paper and ink bound by a hard cover. How can this be alive? If I put it on the ground and leave the building, it's not gonna chase after me. So what is it actually claiming about itself? Well, it says um, it is living, it is powerful, it's sharp. But what does it do with that sharpness? It says it, it pierces into the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And by doing so, it discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart of the reader. So in other words, if you have some sort of belief that you cling to strongly, and then you open up the Bible and you read something that is in opposition to that belief, then you now are in a position where the Bible is kind of judging the thoughts and intents of your heart based on how you react to that. Do you cling to whatever idea you brought into your study in the first place and disregard what the Bible says? Or are you willing to be humble before the scriptures and humble before God and actually follow the instructions that you are reading? And so in that way, it is alive. It's like a, like a mirror. When you look into it, you're either going to see some version of yourself or you're going to see God. And which one of those things do you want to see? All right. So that's how it is alive. Let's turn now to a book pretty close in, in proximity to Hebrews. You just want to turn toward the end of the book a little bit to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. There are two books in the Bible called Peter. First Peter, second Peter. So you want the second one? And I'm looking at the end of chapter one. Second Peter one, and we'll start in verse 19. There's a couple big thoughts in here. The Bible says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the concept of prophecy. That can mean a few different things, but in its most general sense, prophecy is when God speaks to man, and then man writes down what he hears from God or she. There are some examples of female prophets in the Bible. Verse 21 here explains this process. They were holy men, or again, sometimes women, um, who were of God, and they spoke, they wrote down, they conveyed messages as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. So in other words, everything that we read inside of this book claims divine origin. If we're reading the book of Jeremiah, for example, what Jeremiah is claiming is that God spoke to him and then he wrote down God's messages in his own words. So what we're reading off the page is the message of God in the language of Jeremiah. It's kind of a mixture of both divinity and humanity, but we can't lose sight of the idea. It's a divine message. That's why we're starting with what the Bible says about itself. What we're reading is a message from the divinity, the most high God. Okay, so now that we've kind of established what the Bible is claiming about itself and the power that it has and how it came into being, 
we always want to know how Jesus felt about whatever it is that we're talking. So how did Jesus himself understand the Holy Scriptures? Well, if you go to the book of John, and this is a tricky one because there's actually four books in the Bible called John. There is a larger book that is just John. That's the Gospel of John, and that is nestled in between the books of Luke and Acts toward the beginning of the New Testament. That's the longest one, and that's where we're going, John chapter 10. Toward the end of the Bible, there are three additional books, very small little letters, called 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We'll be visiting those as well, but not today. So for today, we want the Gospel of John, chapter 10. I'm looking at verse 35, and it's a verse in a larger context of something that Jesus is saying. Um, and we're not going to look at the whole thing. I just want one little piece of verse 35. Look in your Bibles. And you may actually see a part of the sentence in parentheses. The original author, John, didn't put those parentheses there. All the punctuation was added by translators later on. So you may not see parentheses. It may be noted in a different way in your particular translation. But I'm looking for... Um, verse 35 says, If he called them gods to whom the word of God came. And what I'm looking for is what follows that. And the scripture cannot be broken. So in other words, Jesus held the scriptures, or what we call the Bible, to be in such high authority that in his mind they could not be broken. Whatever they said was true, and there was no teaching or action of man that could interfere with that or break it or change it in any way. I would recommend that we adopt some version of that perspective as well. Because if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. Amen? The scripture cannot be broken. So what did the scripture say in the mind of Jesus? What was the point of the scripture? Same book, John. Go backwards to chapter 5. John chapter 5. And I am now looking in verse 39. This is once again in context of kind of a lengthy, almost sermon that Jesus is preaching here. In verse 39, Jesus says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. In other words, Jesus says, Yeah, you think you know the Old Testament really well. And you think that knowing them is what gives you eternal life, but you're missing the point because all of those writings are actually showing you how to recognize me, Jesus. When Jesus comes, the leadership should have been able to recognize him because they knew the Old Testament. Jesus believed the entire purpose of the scriptures was to point believers to Messiah, to himself. And then through faith in Messiah, we would then achieve eternal life. That's the gospel, as we as Christians understand it. So if we are reading the Old Testament or even the New Testament, and we are not learning about Jesus, then we're reading it wrong. We're reading it wrong. The purpose of the Bible is to learn about Jesus. Even the Old Testament, which was written prior to Jesus. And we're going to see a lot of examples of that as we go forward in our studies here. To round this out, I want you to go to the very last book of the Bible. It's called Revelation. And it's a pet peeve of mine when we call it Revelations with an S on it, because that's not actually the title. It's one singular revelation. I'd like you to go to chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. I'm looking at verse 10 of chapter 19. This is a long verse. And I'm just looking at the last sentence of this verse. So it is uh, an angel of God talking to John, who's the author of Revelation. And he says, again, looking at the very last sentence of verse 10, he says, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is how the Old Testament can be revealing Jesus even hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus was born as a man because they are prophetic. They tell the future. 
And the Bible says, God says, that the way that Jesus testifies of himself is through prophecy. I bring that up because that's a good pivot point to what you and I are going to be doing in these studies. We're going to be looking at the Bible through a specific lens of prophecy. We want to know what is coming, especially now when we live in such a scary and confusing time of history when this year is certainly not ending like it began and it has challenged every norm that we've ever had. Many of us want to know what the future holds. What's coming next? What is all of this about? That's why we're going to be looking at this prophetically. So if the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, it should make perfect sense to us when we read in John chapter 14. So we're going back to the Gospel of John. Chapter 14. It's part of a very lengthy sermon of Jesus's that stretches for like, I don't know, four chapters here. Um, but in chapter 14, verse 29, Jesus makes this very straightforward yet powerful statement. He says, Now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. In other words, when Jesus says something is going to happen, and then in the process of time, you actually see it happen the way he said it was going to, you're going to realize that he knows what he's talking about. That he does, in fact, have the ability to, to see and to know and to communicate to us the future. Now, how many can do that? Can you? Do you know the future? In January, did you know the world would shut down for at least six months or longer? <laughs> of course not. Nobody did. None of us can see the future. Well, what does the Bible say about who can tell the future? Join me for our first Old Testament scripture of the series. I'm looking at the book of Isaiah. Now, here's a trick. If you open up the Bible to about the middle, ta-da! you're probably in Isaiah, okay? That's a pretty easy way to find it. Open up to around the middle and you're gonna find Isaiah. Isaiah is a very long book. I'm looking at chapter 46. Isaiah 46 and starting in verse nine. These are the words of God. Isaiah is recording the words of God here. And God says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Very simply, God is saying, I'm going to tell you what is going to happen in the future. Even from the very beginning of something, I will tell you how it's going to end, and no one can do that except me. If we are to believe that, friends, if we believe what the Bible says, and this is one of these moments where we're going to bump into a pre-existing belief in our hearts and the Hebrews 4 verse 12 model is going to come here and, kind of, and discern the thoughts and intents of our hearts. If we truly believe what the Bible says here, that God and only God can tell the future, does that not call into question all of the human beings who claim to know the future? Every psychic, every medium, every astrologer? People make a lot of money predicting the future of things. And yet God says he's the only one who can do it. Our last scripture for today will also be in the book of Isaiah. And I would like you to join me in chapter 8. Okay. Isaiah chapter 8. And I'm, I will read verses 19 and 20. Because God had the same issue. The same one we're talking about now. What about the psychic down the street? 
He claims he can tell the future. Is he wrong? God was in a situation like this with his own people. So he says, starting in verse 19, When they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The law and the testimony is uh, the Bible's way of referring to itself. The law would be the first five books of the Old Testament. The testimony would be the rest of the Old Testament. So God is saying, rather than go to those people who might lie to you, who might be wrong, who are certainly not God, why don't you come ask me? And why don't you test what you hear from other people against what you read in my word? Because if the psychic down the street says something that is in contradiction to what the Bible in front of you is telling you, you have to make a choice. Which one do I believe? And God is, of course, hoping that you will pick him and his word. So that's a pretty good introduction to the word of God and what it says about itself. And obviously, we will look at a lot more texts in future lessons, but I wanted to make sure that we had this foundation first so that we understand that when we run into something that challenges us and really makes us think or might even um, contradict a, a firmly held belief that we have in our hearts, that we should have confidence when we choose to believe what the Bible says over what our heart wants. The Bible claims it is a communication directly from God. And if our goal is to get to know God, then we should always choose what he says as the truth. So today we have learned that the Bible is the word of God, the words of God as heard and recorded by the prophets. And it reveals things about God or counsel from God. And as we go forward, as I said, we will learn what God says about several very important topics, but we will also learn important prophecies where God predicts the future. We will see him predict many of the biggest historical events that have happened on planet Earth hundreds of years before they occurred. And through our studies of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, as well as Revelation in the New Testament, we will learn what is still in store for us today, even now in the 21st century. So God bless you. I hope you have, uh, I hope this was fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And I hope to see you again in our next installment of What the Bible Says. Next time we get together, we will look at the idea of where did evil come from? Where did badness come from? Why do we live in a world where so much goes wrong all the time? What is the Bible's explanation for all of that? I'll see you then. But as we close, if you are willing to accept the Bible as God's words directly from him, as heard and recorded by the prophets, or even if that's too much, even if you're willing to just stick it out and test the Bible and see what it says and then make your decision, then I would like you to pray with me right now. I'm going to pray that the Lord will, will accept whatever amount of faith you have right now and that through this process he will build it even stronger. Let's pray. Loving Father, Thank you for hearing the commitments that have been made right now. And I pray that you administer to every heart who is hearing this message, every heart who might be uh, eager to follow where you are leading, or even every heart that is a little bit questioning and unsure. And enter into those people's lives and sharpen their minds and dwell with them and inside of them every moment until they are ready to follow you where it is that you're leading. Bring peace to every one of us. Bring healing to every one of us. 
and show us the kinds of miracles that we need to be able to move forward in faith. We ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you, friends. See you next time.